Good morning. My name is Natasha Reed Rice, and I have the great honor of serving on the board of directors for the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. I want to welcome you to day two of GBPI's 16th annual policy conference entitled Insights 2022, Treating Care Workers as Essential, Not Invisible. This topic is personal to me. I grew up spending my summers with my grandmother, Helen Everson Lewis in Snellville, Georgia. My grandmother, like many black women in her generation, was a domestic worker. She cleaned homes and raised other people's children. And one family in particular, she raised their children from toddlers to teens. I would often go to work with her during the summer and help her clean, or at least I thought I was doing that, <laughs> help her clean homes. While I thought that her work and her care was so significant, I often saw her value overlooked. And I saw that she retired without any retirement benefits. In essence, all of her hard work and her sacrifice was rendered invisible upon her retirement. It reminds me of one of my favorite quotes by Toni Morrison, the great author. She says, and she had nothing to fall back on, not maleness, not whiteness, not ladyhood, not anything. And out of the profound desolation of her own reality, she may well have invented herself. My grandmother and many other women in this industry of care have had to find ways to invent themselves, to claim dignity when others did not give it to them, to claim respect when it wasn't offered, and ultimately to claim visibility when others rendered them invisible. We must do more to create the space for care workers to invent themselves, to speak up for their needs, and to be seen by policy and budget priorities. In essence, we've got work to do to create the infrastructure that one of our panelists last night, Joycelyn Fry, described that's necessary to care for our care workers. Today, we're at the fulcrum of the conference. That point, when you begin to bridge what you learned yesterday and use it now to leverage what you'll hear today. Yesterday was big. We covered a lot of areas. We, we dove into some deep, dove in deeply to some topics that we haven't necessarily always considered when thinking about budget priorities in this state. You heard from state and national leaders like Tamika Atkins, the executive director of Pro Georgia. We heard from jo jo Josephine Calapini, the executive director of Family Values at Work, and Joycelyn Fry, who I just referenced, the president of the National Partnership for Women and Families. On our concurrent panels, we learned about the differences and the similarities of the care worker experience in child care, health care, and elder care. We specifically learned how the pandemic has affected women of color and mothers of color in and through those sectors. Panelists centered the care worker experience so that we could see them, addressed care worker rights, worker organizing, and structural issues that continue to make care worker organizing a challenge. If you attended the grassroots legislative advocacy training in the evening, you also learned from community partners who were transforming yesterday's big ideas into action. We were able to find out where we can dig in, with whom can we dig in, and pursue our own personal next steps to achieve a more equitable Georgia for all. Bringing all that we learned yesterday, today, we will hope that we're all able to learn how state and federal dollars drive the change that Georgians need and deserve. We'll learn how Georgia Budget and Policy Institute's policy priorities, work, and expertise help to advance lasting solutions that expand economic opportunity and well being for all. So, as we move into today, we want you to again bear in mind four simple truths. And these were um, spoken about and shared throughout the panel and the conversations yesterday. First, Black women care workers are the backbone of Georgia's workforce, making all other work possible. Taking care of children, taking care of health, 
so that we can all continue to try our best to thrive. Second, racism, disinvestment, and a brutal pandemic have hit Black women care workers especially hard. An economy in which Black women care workers thrive is an economy where all workers thrive. We, the people of Georgia, can make change happen. Almost, if I was in a live context, I would say, repeat after me. We, (laughs) the people of Georgia, can make change happen. There are a lot of people and organizations who have made today possible. So we can't go further without offering our great thanks to them. GBPI would like to thank the sponsors of Insights 2022, those who support and help in driving conversations around equity and Georgia's policy landscape have been essential. Support from these sponsors have ensured each of us that we're able to join today safely, virtually, and free of charge. I'd like to give special thanks to the following sponsors, the Community Foundation for Greater Atlanta, Georgia Families Unitas, Georgia Council on Developmental Disabilities, the Metro Atlanta Chamber, the Southern Poverty Law Center, United Way of Greater Atlanta, the Georgia Partnership for Excellence in Education, GEARS, G-E-E-A-R-S, Georgians for a Healthy Future, ESSIG Public Policy Research, and Voices for Georgia's Children. Now, as we prepare to dive into the conversations today, here are a few reminders. I wanna remind you a little bit about how the conference will work. I know every virtual conference is different and many of you were able to experience those differences um, last year and now see that we're even building upon those nuances this year to have a more successful and improved conference. First, you likely saw that when you joined this session, a new tab popped out. This is where you'll see a video, but on the far right, you'll see messaging and questions. You can drop questions for our panelists in the question section and in the other comments in the chat. After each panel, you'll then head back to the original browser window to navigate to the next schedule. Our networking sessions are going to work like Zoom meetings. So when you click on click to join those, your Zoom application will open up. If you look at the original browser window with the full conference website, you'll see a menu on the left with several items. Those items include first, schedule. If you're watching this, you probably figured out how to access a session. You click schedule. The full schedule has every event listed. In each schedule item, you'll then click join online session to see that particular panel. Under people, you can then see a list of all the attendees. And we hope that you'll find people that you wanna engage with throughout the rest of today. There may be speakers asking questions, dropping comments in the chat, all of that is you're able to do through that particular link. When you see someone you wanna speak with more, head to people, search their name, and then click connect. Once connected, you can message them directly in the event page or also send them an email. In the bulletin section, you'll find tweets using the hashtag insights22. You'll also be able to see other posts that people can add or have added. And if you want to post a message to the bulletin, just click create a post. Each schedule item has a list of speakers, but you can also see the full list under the speakers menu item. Please check out our sponsors in the sponsors menu. You can find them all listed there, including the ones that I've just mentioned by name. All of the materials related to our panels can be found both in the schedule item and the materials menu item. I know all of this is a lot (laughs) that I've just shared with you quickly, but it all has worked together to create the most interactive virtual conference experience we could provide. Finally, As we stated earlier with the great thanks that we've offered to our sponsors, we are continually 
open to additional donations to make conferences like this and the great work that our staff at GBPI are, are, have underway and are doing possible. So there is a link to donate. In the upper right-hand corner, you'll be able to contact support if you have any questions and check your notifications. If you do have questions, the GBPI staff will be able to help you in the chat. And now, let me introduce GBPI's Senior Policy Analyst for Tax and Budget, Mr. Danny Canso. He's going to lead us in an overview of Georgia's fiscal position and the newly released fiscal year 2022 executive budget. So grab hold of your seat. We're ready to take off. We're ready to dive in. We're ready to tackle the hard questions and the hard issues to make Georgia what it should be for all of its citizens. Thanks for joining today and enjoy. Thank you, Natasha, and good morning. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Danny Canso, uh, and as Natasha said, uh, we are here to discuss the overview of Georgia's FY 2023 and amended 2022 state budget. Georgia's constitution requires that one piece of legislation is passed every year, the state budget. It touches all Georgians across our state and is the most fundamentally important piece of legislation in deciding the direction that our state will go across public education, healthcare, economic mobility, and essentially every program uh, that the state is involved in. And so uh, just before we get started, uh, a, a little bit of a primer on Georgia's state budget. Uh, the fiscal year runs from July 1st to June 30th. Uh, and so as we stand here in mid-January, uh, the state legislature is now considering two budgets submitted uh, by Governor Kemp, uh, who the budget process starts with. Uh, the amended budget that will take us through June 30th, uh, where the state will make adjustments to account for really dramatic changes in state revenues uh, that have allowed us to make up much of the ground that was cut back uh, as the state's primary response to the pandemic, uh, and, and we'll cover uh, those areas that have been restored, uh, and also to make adjustments in enrollment uh, across public schools, Medicaid, and other programs. And so those budgets, uh, and, and of course, the full year budget that will take effect in July 1st, uh, that, that really uh, marks uh, change across several significant areas, uh, $5,000 pay raises uh, for essentially all state employees, uh, $2,000 pay raises for certified public school teachers, uh, $2,000 pay raises for state uh, university employees, uh, and, and, and other changes. Uh, and so that budget starts in the House of Representatives uh, and, and joint budget hearings have, have just concluded uh, or, or will conclude today. Uh, and, and, and then the House will begin their process of working on that budget through the Appropriations Committee. Uh, once it moves through the full House, it will go to the Senate for consideration. Uh, they will uh, continue to make changes uh, and, and evolve the budget and then uh, the Senate will pass uh, their version, uh, and, and that will result in a conference committee coming together uh, with three members from both the House and Senate to decide on the full budget that will go to Governor Kemp's desk uh, in usually uh, in late March or early April. And then from that point, the governor will have 40 days uh, to decide uh, whether to use his line item veto uh, and, and, and to sign the budget. And so, uh, th this budget does, does uh, make several strides forward. Uh, however, we are still just approaching where the state was uh, prior to the Great Recession. Uh, and, and so in some ways, that is positive. Uh, it, it marks an opportunity to uh, where the state now is, is in a much different fiscal position than we were last year or even in the year prior. Uh, and, and so things like Medicaid expansion, uh, funding a, a needs-based uh, higher education scholarship, uh, adding additional funding in public, public education uh, for things like an opportunity weight 
that would help students living in poverty. All those things uh, now, because of Georgia's evolving revenue picture, uh, may be possible. Uh, and, and so what we see is uh, a restoration of about 11% uh, from where we were in last year's budget, uh, equivalent to about $3 billion. Uh, and, and so uh, again, what that means is now the state is spending uh, or, or proposes spending uh, $2,775 per person across Georgia. That's across public education, uh, healthcare, and all of the state's core functions. Uh, and, and, and that would uh, include uh, restoring the cuts that have been made to the state's public education formula, uh, some of those salary increases, and also uh, a few of the governor's priorities, such as a reinsurance program uh, to target costs on the individual exchange uh, ACA healthcare marketplace. Uh, but uh, so, so as we approach uh, 2008 funding levels, uh, we're just making up that, that ground loss. So for context, it took about 11 years uh, for the state to get from 2008, uh, which was the, the high watermark of spending, to an equivalent level per person uh, in, in FY 2019 uh, and 2020 prior to the pandemic. And so now with this proposed budget, uh, we are just getting close to that level, uh, but as we'll discuss, uh, in the case of state employees, there are some changes that have been made uh, where we've seen state government cut back dramatically. Uh, so the 2023 budget includes a $5,000 cost of living increase for state employees, as well as changes uh, to the 401k match and uh, offering 40 hours of paid leave annually. Uh, and that is in response to turnover rates that are at an all time high uh, really across the board. So those turnover rates average 23%, but as we've heard in budget presentations from state agencies, uh, as in the case of corrections officers at the Department of Juvenile Justice, those turnover rates are over 90% annually. Uh, and, and, and so uh, that is because of persistently low uh, pay levels. Uh, in many cases, those starting salaries are uh, about $30,000 uh, or lower, uh, and also because we've seen the workforce scaled back dramatically. So Georgia's workforce at 76,000 employees is down about 9% since FY 2021, uh, two fiscal years ago, and uh, down about, or, or I'm sorry, down about 9% uh, over the last two years, and down 25% since the Great Recession, uh, since prior to the Great Recession. Uh, when the state had over 100,000 state employees. So in some cases, uh, that, that is modernization, but in other cases, those are state employees that are dramatically stretched across the board. And that has significant racial and gender equity implications as well, uh, where 65% of all state employees are women, 46% uh, are black and 3% are Hispanic. Uh, and, and when the state uh, has a median pay of $39,000, and in many of these high turnover rates, uh, a, a areas a much lower uh, starting rate of pay, uh, that is a core racial equity issue uh, where this is progress, uh, but certainly uh, is not likely to be enough uh, to completely stem uh, that, that, that trend. Uh, and, and the state is going to need to evaluate both those personnel numbers and compensation in the future. Now, uh, in terms of state spending, 73% of the $30 billion budget uh, funds education and healthcare, uh, 73 cents of every dollar that the state spends. Uh, the primary area of spending is pre-K through K through 12 education. Uh, that's about 37%. Uh, combined with higher education, uh, that gets to about 52% of state spending. The next largest area is healthcare at about 21% of the state budget. Uh, that's followed by transportation, which is funded through the state gas tax uh, that is earmarked for infrastructure projects, uh, followed by corrections. And then uh, that, that is the, the whole rest of government, all other state agencies make up about 4% uh, of state spending. Uh, debt service, uh, which will cover uh, where, where there are some missed opportunities for the state is about 4%. Uh, and then human services, uh, about 3%. Uh, 
And so uh, importantly, what, what we're seeing is Georgia's rebound powered by uh, a surge in tax collections, primarily from the state's income tax, but also from the state's sales tax, uh, where we're seeing that same trend of increased consumption uh, that's occurring across the country. So Georgia's income tax makes up 51% of state revenue. The largest source of revenue by far is the personal income tax. Uh, that's about 46%, over $14 billion. Uh, that, that is followed by uh, other taxes and fees, which combine for about 12% of the state budget. And then about 12% of revenues are earmarked for certain sources, designated funds. So motor fuel taxes uh, go exclusively to fund infrastructure, uh, lottery dollars fund uh, pre-K and higher education, uh, scholarship programs, uh, the tobacco settlement uh, that goes to primarily Medicaid. Uh, and again, so the personal income tax has been revised uh, up $1.4 billion uh, from, from, from where we were uh, last year, uh, $750 million in the sales tax, over $500 million in the corporate income tax. And so, as you can see from this chart, in the case of the corporate income tax, that's a rebound uh, of about 60% from where we were uh, in, in 2022, where, where the state anticipated to be. Uh, and, and so that follows uh, really what has been a very volatile of cycle of revenues in the pandemic. And, and so what is responsible for that surge in revenues? Well, uh, the consensus is uh, that it, it is primarily the unprecedented federal intervention that we saw uh, from the CARES Act uh, to the American Rescue Plan to the PPP loan program that, that benefited businesses across the state uh, with billions of dollars. All of that uh, combined with stimulus payments and, and, and other uh, changes in, in, in federal spending combined to drive that surge in tax collections and help to avoid what was projected to be really a massive cliff and what could have been uh, one of the worst recessions in modern history. Uh, so with all that said, uh, revenues are still you know, experiencing the, these volatile jumps and, and that uh, is not you know, licensed to uh, cut those revenue streams. And in fact, you know, as, as I said, we are just getting back to where we were uh, now pre-COVID and also uh, pre-Great Recession. And so that means that a lot of deficits uh, have been created over those years that we now have an opportunity to restore and significant funding on hand to do so. So uh, th that is kind of, there, there's no better example for that trend than K through 12 education. So what we see is uh, in the amended year budget, both and in, in the full year budget, uh, the, the cuts that were made in response to the pandemic have been restored. So that means $383 million uh, in, in both budgets for K through 12 schools. Uh, however, in 11 of the 14 most recent years since the Great Recession, uh, we have underfunded that formula. And that adds up to over $7 billion that have been lost uh, during that period. So that is kind of important context as we go forward uh, that, that we need to continue to have the mindset of making up that gap. Uh, we do see a $2,000 pay raise uh, that brings the pay raise since 2019 uh, up to $5,000. However, I do want to note that that starts in September uh, of 2023. And so that is one thing that the General Assembly has adjusted in the past uh, and, and will likely revisit uh, to make that a full $2,000 pay raise. We also see uh, funding, I want to note, for school buses uh, in, in the amended budget, $188 million. Uh, that's general funds. And so uh, the state projects that that could buy about 1,750 uh, buses at an average cost of $88,000. Uh, that, that's likely to be less with vehicle prices increasing uh, in recent years. However, we do have uh, over 3,400 uh, buses on the road at, at last count uh, that were 14 years or older. And so as, as we look at safety standards, uh, over 1 million students are on the road uh, on average for our public schools daily. Uh, so, so that is an area where state funding has gone down since the mid nineties from about half of all transportation funding uh, down to less than 20% in recent years. Uh, and, and so certainly uh, that is another example of an area uh, where the state uh, needs to do more to meet needs across Georgia. And, and as I mentioned, uh, 
we are uh, now one of six states that don't dedicate specific funding uh, for students living in poverty. And so that's hopefully another issue that the General Assembly uh, will seek to address uh, with increased revenues uh, and, and, and also uh, some of the revenue solutions on the table as well. Uh, with higher education, uh, that, that was also an area that was heavily cut during the pandemic. Uh, we see most of those cuts now restored. Uh, in addition to that, there's funding in the budget to eliminate what's known as the special institutional fee. That's a fee that was originally uh, labeled as temporary, created in 2009 in response to the revenue uh, declines of the Great Recession. Uh, and, and that is now the largest student fee uh, and, and that is set to be eliminated uh, if, if this funding continues to remain in the budget. Uh, there's, there's similarly funding for a $5,000 pay raise for USG educators and an important change that would bring uh, HOPE scholarship and grant payments uniformly up to 90% for all USG and TCSG institutions. Uh, currently, uh, those payments range between 76% and 90%, and, and, and that will help uh, to bring equity uh, to some of those students at, at institutions across our state. Uh, and then there is a change to add two fields to the HOPE grant, which covers 100% of, of tuition. Uh, one uh, item that, that is not in this budget that remains un unfunded uh, is a needs-based scholarship for higher education. Uh, currently, the HOPE scholarship is, is purely merit-based, uh, and, and, and so that's one area where uh, lawmakers can look to build on those investments. Uh, in healthcare, we see some improvements, uh, $38 million to uh, add for express enrollment for children uh, whose families are receiving SNAP, uh, food assistance, or TANF, uh, cash assistance uh, under those federal programs. That'll help to streamline those uh, and, and make sure those children who are eligible uh, are getting the, the Medicaid coverage that they need, uh, as well as increasing the Medicaid term of coverage for new mothers from six months to 12 months. We also see $124 million to finance the governor's proposed uh, reinsurance waiver program. Uh, that would affect the ACA exchange, some of the plans on there, uh, and essentially put that money into trying to balance out the cost between enrollees uh, to, to push insurers to offer uh, lower cost plans uh, and, and possibly enter those markets as well. Uh, and so we've seen record enrollment with the increased ACA subsidies that have been approved under the American Rescue Plan and now 654 Georgians at the end of last year participating in that market. So, so that is one area uh, where the state can continue, continue to build uh, there is $16 million in the budget for a, a, a part of the waiver plan that seems unlikely to gain approval from the administration that's still pending uh, before uh, the Department of Health and Human Services that would abandon the affordable care marketplace, uh, make Georgia unique in doing that. And so that's money that potentially, if that waiver is in fact denied, uh, could be used for other health care programs. Uh, about $130 million has been added to the budget for the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. Uh, however, we still do see some cuts. Uh, we see over $20 million in, in funding that has not been restored from the cuts that were made uh, at the start of the pandemic uh, for, for child and adolescent mental health uh, and, and some cuts in, in other important areas there. Uh, so there is more to be done, especially as the state seeks to achieve parity uh, and make a major investment in mental health this year. Uh, what, what we've seen, however, is, is no plan to kind of pick up uh, where the governor's Medicaid proposal seems to have left off after the administration has denied uh, the attempt to use work requirements, which would have reduced the enrollment from about 500,000 eligible Georgians uh, down to about 50,000. So that comes with a much greater cost if, if we're to uh, cover according to the standards that the administration would require, that would mean about 270,000 Georgians at a cost that is nearly five times as high as with Medicaid expansion. Uh, so that's about uh, $500 per enrollee if, if we go the traditional route, uh, not to mention between $1.4 and $1.9 billion that the state would now receive as an added bonus for expanding Medicaid. And so 
that that was approved under the American Rescue Plan and, and, and would essentially give the state enough resources to be able to cover the cost of that program uh, for about seven years. So uh, a few other proposals that, that are noteworthy in, in the budget uh, that, that, that are also unique. The governor proposes using 1.6 billion of what was a $3.8 billion surplus in revenue collections last year to give across the board payments of $250 to $500 uh, to Georgians across the state. And so uh, to be clear, that $3.8 billion was raised at the same time that the state was implementing uh, over a billion dollars of budget cuts, uh, cutting from things like K through 12 education, behavioral health, and, and other areas. And so what the state has done with $3.8 billion is fill the revenue shortfall reserve up to uh, the maximum of $4.3 billion. And then uh, this amount was available above that, uh, and, and they're choosing to use this as a rebate. Uh, but those funds are extremely flexible. Uh, and, and so uh, that they could be targeted uh, in a better way to give higher payments to, to low and middle income Georgians uh, structured as, as something like an EITC or to restore some of those longstanding cuts uh, and, and help to build progress in things like education and healthcare. Uh, another area that, that is uh, very important is uh, the American Rescue Plan funding that, that remains with the state. Uh, Georgia is set to receive the second half of that funding uh, in, in between March and April of this year. Uh, and so that, that brings the total to uh, over $4.7 billion that is extremely flexible. Uh, that, th those dollars are, are not mentioned in this budget uh, and, and for the most part have not been allocated. And that presents really what could be a generational opportunity uh, for major investments in Georgia. Uh, we, you know, that, that creates opportunities to create things like earn, earn income tax credit, uh, to strengthen the child independent tax credit, and, and to invest in working families and, and areas that have been cut back uh, so much in recent years. Uh, however, you know, again, uh, now is not the time to implement uh, risky things like cuts to the top income tax rate uh, or a transformation uh, of, of, of the tax structure uh, because of the volatility of the revenues and the fact that we're just making up much of that ground. Uh, one area that, 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 that is also unique in this budget uh, is the governor's proposal of $600 million uh, for what the administration calls a transformation project uh, of, of Georgia's prisons. So uh, unusually, the, the amended year budget uses about $433 million in general funds to make a purchase uh, of a prison uh, and, and contribute to the state's plan to also build a 3,000 person prison, uh, which, which is also matched with $168 million in bond funding for, for 2023. And so uh, setting aside the, the idea of, you know, if we should be building and, and acquiring these prisons, uh, it, it's first worth mentioning that general funds and bonds are, are very different. And the state uh, under our constitution can borrow up to 10% every year. Uh, because Georgia has a AAA bond rating, uh, the highest possible, uh, that, that gives us an advantage that allows us to borrow at a low cost uh, and manage projects in, in, in a uh, more affordable way uh, to be able to make those investments over the long term. Uh, so right now we have a debt service of about five and a half percent uh, or about $1.3 billion a year, which is much lower than that 10% minimum. Uh, so bonding only 163 million while spending effectively 433 million uh, in, in cash, uh, you know, may not be the wisest financial strategy. Uh, second to that, uh, Georgia also right now has two contracts with private prisons for $130 million uh, estimated in the upcoming fiscal year uh, to house 8,000 prisoners. Uh, and so, you know, the state will have to explain, or do we plan to maintain those contracts? Uh, it's been mentioned that uh, four prisons would be closed as part of this plan. Uh, and, and, and we do know that conditions across Georgia's prisons are extremely unsafe. We've seen a record number of homicides uh, and, and, and really, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, an abundance of other issues that the Department of Justice uh, is investigating. Uh, and, and so, you know, that, that, that is an area that, that does need to be explained, but also uh, from a fiscal standpoint could also provide a path to accomplishing uh, more priorities at the same cost. Uh, as well, uh, we've seen the, the state's rainy day fund, the revenue shortfall reserve, reach a record high 15% of the prior year state revenues uh, at, at over uh, $4.3 billion. So that provides a tremendous cushion uh, for the state going forward uh, and, and also uh, the opportunity uh, to, to withdraw a portion of those funds uh, if, if the governor chooses to do that. Uh, so as, as we conclude, uh, you know, I, I think on balance, this budget shows uh, progress in restoring many of the cuts that were made when we went into the pandemic. That was the state's primary response to what were really significant uh, negative revenue predictions. Initially, those predictions were that the state uh, would lose about 10%, $2.2 billion of revenues, uh, and, and those budgets were made, th those cuts were made across the board. So with those restorations, however, uh, it, it's still the case that many of these agencies have had uh, vacant positions eliminated that have stretched their workforces thinner. Uh, those turnover rates are at record highs uh, and, and, and pay raises, uh, cost of living increases are a step in the right direction, but, but we've seen uh, the cost of living go up too. Uh, the, the CPI increase level for, for 2021 is 7%. Uh, and, and so, you know, even more funding uh, still, it, we, we still have to grow with the needs of the state uh, and, and make those investments. And as we do so, uh, there are clear bipartisan revenue solutions on the table that the General Assembly could consider this year. Right now, Georgia's tobacco tax uh, is at the second lowest level in America, just behind Missouri. Uh, going to the national average of $1.91 and parity on smokeless tobacco would raise $700 million a year. Uh, Georgia is also one of four states that offers a loophole called the double deduction. Uh, that could raise $175 million a year. Uh, the General Assembly in recent years ha has been working to, uh, you know, considering measures that would make the tax code more transparent. Right now, uh, for, for many of, of, of the tax credits offered, uh, we, we just don't have the data to evaluate the return on investment to the state. Uh, and for some of those programs that we do, uh, you know, there, there are clear opportunities uh, to, to improve uh, how we're managing them uh, and, and to raise revenue. Uh, and, and then again, we now see over $10 billion in tax breaks uh, in, in the 2022 uh, budget. Uh, and, and so as we continue that process of transparency and evaluation, eliminating those return, lo those low return breaks uh, can help to make those much needed investments. And so uh, with that, I will uh, conclude our presentation of the uh, fiscal year 2023 state budget. Uh, and, and, you know, again, I, I, I thank you all uh, so much for joining us. Uh, and I will turn it over to Rose Scott, uh, executive producer and host of Closer Look on WAB. Thank you, Daniel. And good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Well, at least Representative Park says he can. Good morning. So yes, here we are, 2022. And yeah, we're all still coping with living our daily lives with the coronavirus. And throughout all of this, and you heard Danny touch on this, we keep hearing how this pandemic is highlighting already existing inequities and disparities among various populations, and especially women, Black women, uh, Latino and Hispanic communities, low wage earners and rural communities. And of course, our public school students and educators. And so as our daily lives continue to turn, we know so goes the work of our elected officials. So another legislative session is underway at the state capitol. And oh yeah, it's a huge election year as well. But until November is upon us, state lawmakers still have a job to do. So this portion of the GBPI conference is about listening, 
learning, and exchanging ideas from a few of those lawmakers regarding definite and potential legislative measures. Now, we'll also make room for your questions towards the end of the session, so feel free to utilize the Q&A section of this webinar. With that being said, let's welcome Representative Sharon Cooper, Representative Sam Park, Senator Larry Walker, Senator Tanya Anderson, and Danny Canso will be with us as well, GBPI policy analysts. Good morning to you all. Thanks for taking the time. I really appreciate it. I feel like I'm doing a, a, an, ed, an edition of Closer Look, but that's okay. Um, but just a session reminder, while we all are encouraging dialogue, I do want to just remind folks it's important to allow one another to complete their viewpoint. And, and counterpoints are welcome. I'm not a referee, but uh, we just want to make sure that everyone attending this webinar gets an opportunity to hear full viewpoints. And don't worry, I will allow all of you to get a chance to have a counterpoint. So, with that being said, let's talk about. Let's begin with the overall budget. Now, we all heard Daniel and his overview of what he gave. And even though this is the highest ever for the state budget proposed at $30.2 billion, I know a lot of you have some concerns. So that's where we'll begin. And, and this is just for the lawmakers for now. So Representative Sharon Cooper, I'll let you go first. Take a couple of minutes just to give your overall analysis of Governor Kemp's proposed budget. Sorry, it took me a minute to unmute myself. It's okay, it happens to us all. All right. Um, overall, I'm, I'm very glad about the $5,000 uh, bonus to state employees. Um, I've been asked to really talk about mental health during this uh, Zoom meeting. And I can tell you that $5,000 will be greatly uh, received by people working in our mental health system. So first of all, let me kudos to the governor for that. Also, you know, there's money in there for the first time for COLA for our retirees. And so I'm thankful for that. Um, overall, you know, there's money for psychiatric care and uh, doing some uh, extra programs on that. And I'm, you know, so uh, all in all, um, I'm pretty pleased with the governor's um, budget. I mean, in a perfect world, certainly I would change some things, but it's not a perfect world. Uh, and uh, as always, uh, we try to be conservative uh, about our money. It's how we got through the last uh, recession and kept our AAA bond rating, which is certainly important uh, as we go forth on building buildings and so forth. Uh, for the university system and for other projects like that. Uh, it makes that those projects cost us a lot less money. Uh, we were only one of about seven states that kept our triple A bond rating uh, during the last recession. So um, we are always been very careful about that and making sure that we even put more money in our rainy day fund. Because I think in the last recession, they went down to something like $60,000, which would not even cover one day of uh, the cost of running the state, um, the state who, uh, meeting our obligations as a state to our teachers and to our employees and all. Uh, so I'll make it short. I'm like say, if I ran the zoo, as I laughingly say, sometimes there are places where I would make some uh, small changes and so forth, uh, but I don't run the zoo. And overall, uh, I think it's okay. Zoo, that's an interesting analogy. <laughs> well, I mean, you might as well laugh about things. I mean, one of the things I think is a problem is uh, we've gotten where we can't laugh and uh, can't communicate and, uh, you know, view things in not such a hostile way in the legislature. And I miss that. It, it, it used to be different. And uh, if we can't laugh at ourselves, we're in trouble as human beings. So I laughingly call it the zoo. Okay. And I would never want to run the zoo. I can tell you that. Uh, why anybody would want to be governor, especially after <laughs> this governor, let's see, he had the tornadoes that ripped up the South. He's had COVID. I mean, he's had the riots, you name it. Uh, at one point, I asked the governor to go check the grounds of the, of the uh, mansion to make sure there weren't locusts 
about ready to descend upon the mansion and the capital, just in jest, uh, because he had had so many crises during his administration. We have moved from one crisis to another. So hopefully things will be a lot calmer. Yeah, and just imagine for so many Georgians, they have this type of crisis almost every day. You're Representative right. Sam Park, let me, Representative Sam Park, let's get you in here. Just your overall analysis of the governor's budget proposal. Sure. So good morning, Rose. Um, Danny, always great to hear from you. Um, I, I so appreciate um, how concise you are. Um, so uh, similar with what uh, Chairwoman uh, Cooper mentioned, uh, I am glad to see a lot of the budget cuts restored. Because um, I think when we're analyzing the budget, we have to, it has to be done in context. It can't be done in a vacuum. And of course, during the 2021 and the 2022 budget, there were severe cuts made. Um, and of course, while hindsight is 2020, I, I would assert that perhaps some of those cuts were perhaps too severe, especially in light of the fact that we have um, reached our uh, maximum amount. And, and how much we could put in our rainy day fund. And of course, you know, what were the majority of those cuts over the past two years that thankfully this budget restores? Um, you know, I think, um, you know, the, the vast majority of those cuts were to K through 12 uh, public education in which what is the opportunity cost that is then missed, right? Students, especially if their education is underfunded, they've got one shot. And so while I think it is important to take a conservative approach when it comes to fiscal management, um, certainly I think we, we, we should and we owe it to uh, Georgia taxpayers and the next generation of Georgians uh, to be as wise as possible when it comes to managing uh, taxpayer funds. Uh, but again, overall, I am glad to see that a lot of these very draconian severe cuts being restored. Um, I think we are moving in the right direction of increasing teacher pay raises. I'm glad to see that promise being fulfilled. Glad to see the $5,000 pay raise for state employees. Again, another good step in the right direction. Uh, but certainly, especially when it comes to some of these um, state employees whose starting salary is twenty, thirty thousand dollars um, $30,000, the cost of uh, the turnover um, you know, I don't think that's necessarily factored in. So, you know, good steps in the right direction, but a, still a lot of work that remains to be done. Thank you, Representative Park. And we should note that Senator Larry Walker, we ex hopefully we expect him to join us soon. Meanwhile, we'll continue with Senator Tanya Anderson. You're overall there, Senator Walker, but we'll go, we'll start with uh, uh, Senator Anderson. Just your, your overall viewpoint of the governor's proposed budget. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, um, Danny, for this invitation. Um, it, it, uh, oh, good morning, Rose. I'm sorry. I said everyone, but you That's are okay. the uh, hostess, ma'am. So um, the, oh, my overall view of the budget, um, I agree with my colleagues that, you know, it's good to see this um, funding restored, especially to our teachers. I just hope we keep that promise uh, when it comes time to um, actually implement it. But um, one of the things that I would like to see is um, more funding um, for mental and um, emotional trauma, especially in our um, K through 12. You know, as our children have endured a lot over the past um, couple of years, teachers too, um, but invested in our children now. And I, and I often say that the seeds we sow now, you know, is the fruit that we bear later. So um, sowing into them um, early is very, very important. I'm happy to see that um, some money was put in uh, for, for Medicaid, especially providing um, new mothers 12 months coverage uh, up from the six months that we actually originally um, had implemented. Um, but we know that fully expanded Medicaid would provide over 450,000 Georgians access to affordable health care. Um, this is an investment um, in the state of Georgia to, to help fight uh, the COVID-19 um, disparities and other health disparities that have been discovered since COVID. Um, and it's not a discovery for some communities, it is a discovery for others. Um, but I think that having uh, those smart investments um, in healthcare, education, and even uh, broadband, because at this point, you know, our children are learning virtually, teachers are teaching virtually, and we have to have access um, to broadband. 
And so um, those are some of the things that I would uh, hope that we can um, get done in this budget. Um, and we also have, you know, we have the, the university systems, but we also have HBCUs um, that we can invest in programs. There's a program at Clark Atlanta for Prostate Research Morehouse. Um, there are partnerships there. But we have to continue to invest in our um, higher education uh, learning institutions. So this is a good start. It's a good conversation, but I want it to be implemented fully. Thank you, Senator Anderson. And now let's welcome in Senator Larry Walker. Senator, thank you for taking the time. We just started this conversation. So I asked each state lawmaker just to give a couple of minutes and give the, their overall analysis of Governor Kemp's proposed budget. Good morning, everybody. I uh, hope you can hear me okay. Somehow my video is cut off. If the host wants to uh, for you all to see me, maybe that's intentional. I'm not sure, but <laughs> but yeah, I've, I'm encouraged uh, by the uh, the budget. I mean, I'm thankful to Governor Kemp and his leadership in keeping Georgia open and uh, not only uh, protecting lives but livelihoods. And of course, our revenue uh, reflects that, and it's uh, a good situation there. I'm really supportive of a lot of the areas he's added new money to, uh, certainly the pay raise for teachers and state employees. Uh, they are, um, let's see here, I'm getting a message there. There I am. Um, the uh, state employees are, you know, been on the front line uh, taking care of us and, and doing the hard work. And a lot of them are woefully underpaid. And of course, turnover has been terrible. And that that's not a good situation. So we want to give good, good service and good customer service to our, uh, the taxpayers and Georgia citizens. And you can't do it when you have uh, that much turnover. I am concerned with the, uh, we're kind of in good times now, and I'm concerned with the recurring costs that this budget uh, will, will cause and reflect. And I'm just a little, I'm very conservative and I'm, I'm worried that I don't want to go crazy with spending and then two or three years down the road, if we hit a bump in the road with the economy or have a recession, have to start cutting again. Uh, so that that's one of my concerns. Um, I'm really excited to uh, know that the, the uh, grants, the ARP grants are soon to be announced. I think they postponed that a little bit because they got some different uh, guidance from the federal government, but I was on one of the committees to look at water and sewer grants. Uh, those should be announced by the end of the month. Um, so that's exciting, which uh, there was a, there were three buckets of money, one being broadband, uh, and that's so critical. And we even uh, emphasized that more during the COVID pandemic with children having to uh, do their homework at do their schoolwork at home or, or attend school virtually. Uh, broadband is, is so critical for that. And of course for businesses too. So I'm excited about the money that we're gonna see and uh, invested in rural broadband and, uh, and water and sewer. And the other pot of money was for economic, uh, the economic impact of, of the pandemic. Uh, so that, that's exciting. I too, I, I would kind of echo what Senator Anderson said, and I don't, I didn't, I just got on, so I don't know what else has been said, but um, I'm very concerned with our mental health crisis in, in Georgia and uh, feel like we need to uh, really take a hard look at the whole situation for mental health and uh, the uh, disabled, uh, developmentally disabled also. I just think we're, we're not funding that at the level we ought to. And I think there's a lot of inefficiencies in the way we are governed that where DCH is our, is our fiscal agent for CMS for Medicaid and yet DBHDD is the provider, the agency responsible for dealing with the providers. And it just creates a lot of, uh, I think bureaucratic uh, redundancy and inefficiencies, and I'd, I'd love to hear what Chairman Cooper had to had to say about that. But 
anyway, good to be with y'all. I don't know how long I'm supposed to talk, but good. that's probably long good. enough. That's okay. Um, Representative Cooper, if you want to respond to that, you can. I can move on because I do have a question. I do have a couple of questions as it relates to our rural populations, and I wanted to start with Senator Walker, but you are more than welcome to respond to his comments. Yep. I think he hit it on the head. Um, I haven't really delved into uh, in the conflict uh, between the department that runs Medicaid and the one that runs uh, DB. HDD, I always get that confused. <laughs> Fitzgerald, every time I do. I, um, so why don't you just go ahead and move on? And Larry, I'll talk to you about it anytime. Come talk to me about it. Thank you, Jim. Or I'll come to your office. And <laughs> all right. Well, Senator Walker, you of all folks know the importance of and the plight of our rural hospitals. Do you see enough in the budget that is addressing still? Because I know for, and, and Georgia has come a long way. I mean, there are a lot of states that we're dealing with so many closures, uh, hospitals and in, in, in our rural populations. Are you seeing enough in this budget? Are you seeing enough allocated to help these communities? Well, it, uh, I am real excited and it's been kind of a Senate priority for uh, the postpartum uh, Medicaid for uh, for mothers on, on Medicaid and extending that to 12 months is awesome. That's gonna have some uh, impact on your rural hospitals and be beneficial. I do think he also included, and again, Chairman Cooper uh, is an expert on this, and but I think he included some uh, higher reimbursements for some Medicaid services. Right, which, they did. Which will greatly help our rural hospitals, but it's still a, very much of a, a struggle. Um, some of his initiatives, the governor's initiatives with regard to the reinsurance program and having more uh, providers in all the counties, more providers on the individual market, insurance market, uh, where you have a more of your population insured uh, because they can now afford the premium. That's huge. I mean, that helps your rural hospitals too, but it's a uh, it's really a constant struggle. Um, now the big challenge, frankly, is workforce. And that's throughout all the industry, but it's particularly uh, a problem with uh, healthcare and, and rural hospitals. You've had folks leaving the profession because just the, uh, the demands they've had to be under with the pandemic. And then you have a, uh, the, you know, the nurses are going to go where they can make the most money. And so you've had a lot of uh, upward wage pressure uh, for nursing and healthcare providers, which just, of course, compounds the, the problem with the cost. And uh, so it's a, that's where we're seeing a real, real, uh, really urgent issue is workforce in the healthcare field. Now, he did put some money in there, too, for, uh, to try to address that. I don't know the dollar figure, but it's, uh, I think, 1,500 new nurse slots and uh, that kind of thing. But that's going to be three, I would think, two, three years down the road before you see any results out of that. Rose, is it okay if I respond? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, one of the things I, and I want to, probably new to a lot of people, is, you know, everybody, you hear about rural hospitals closing. And some of them are just going to close. Uh, it takes about 45,000 people to living in a community or a surrounding community to keep a full service hospital working. And, you know, the having upgraded how much Medicaid pays, that helps, but that will not sur save a rural hospital where there are 3,500 people living in the city or the county and 2,001 county rule it up to it, and you know 4,001 where they don't the area of service doesn't even reach about 45,000 people. So as we go forward, the ones that do have the potential and reach you know that 45,000 threshold, we do need to help stabilize them. But some of our rural hospitals, which people in those communities love so much, cannot sustain a full you know service hospital and we have to find ways and we are looking at ways to at least give emergency services on that so i, I mean 
we do everything we can, but the, you know, rural communities are losing and continue to lose uh, citizens. Uh, if you look at the redistricting maps, uh, people who serve in rural areas, you know, often have to have two, three, four counties they cover, like in a house seat, if we are all supposed to represent 59,600 patients going forward in this new, uh, with the new maps. And many times it takes three or four or five counties strung out to have one representative reach that number and for the senators even more. So just a, a little knowledge, passing the knowledge out. Representative Park or Senator Anderson, you want to chime in on this? Yes, I'd, I'd be happy to make a comment. I, I would agree to a certain degree with Chairwoman Sharon Cooper that due to the decrease in population, particularly in South Georgia, that's put um, pressure and has exacerbated the rural hospital um, uh, closures that we've experienced, uh, which has occurred across the country. Um, but I would make note of a study from Chartist Center, the Chartist Center for Rural Health, which states that being in a Medicaid expansion state decreases by 62% the likelihood of a rural hospital closing. Um, and of course, uh, the state of Georgia could have expanded Medicaid um, back in 2014, where instead of expanding Medicaid and instead of, of accepting billions of dollars of Georgia tax, taxpayer dollars that, that we had already paid out, um, you know, we passed House Bill 990 uh, to take away the power to expand Medicaid from the governor and acquire state legislative approval. Um, so, you know, if, if we look over the past 10 years, the states that have experienced the most rural hospital closures, and I know the state of Georgia had two hospitals closed in the midst of the, of the pandemic. The states that have experienced the most number of rural hospital closures, again, are all states that have refused to expand Medicaid. And so, you know, I hope, I don't think that the debate over whether we expand Medicaid or not should be partisan. If we're looking at this purely from a public policy perspective, if we use information and data, hopefully we can come together, do the right thing, especially for our rural hospitals and expand Medicaid. Well, Sam, that, that, we, did, we did override that law and come up with a, you know, a yes. Georgia plan for expansion. And the Biden administration turned the plan down just recently. It was approved by the Trump administration to go forward. Uh, and we are still in discussion with the Biden administration to try to get a version of an expansion moved forward. So we haven't given up, up on that. And we did change the direction that we were headed of just saying never and hell no, and we'll never expand to working on a Georgia version. And so I'm hoping that as the talks continue, they will find some kind of compromise agreement and we will begin uh, to put that you know, in for uh, our most needy individuals that are 100% below poverty line. Given the fact that between 100 and 135%, they are eligible for the Obama plans. Uh, or the, you know, so I don't know, we're still working on it. Senator Anderson, thank you, Chair Cooper. Sorry. Yeah, this, this um, I, I agree with Sam, this has been so politicized until um, in the reverse, if there were hospitals, if there was broadband, people would probably still be in South Georgia, um, uh, where you know the population probably would not be as diminished as it is. Uh, but even now, um, trying to backpedal and fix a, a problem that uh, we had the opportunity, as Representative Park said before, to get in front of. Now we're trying to play catch up, and even now we have the American Rescue Plan, you know, funding. And so there are just so many opportunities to be able to make Georgia great. Um, and we're number one for business, but we have to also be conscious of, you know, um, how people fare in this state as far as, you know, the economy, healthcare, um, education, all of those things, Matt, it, 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 come, it just comes to, it's a holistic uh, uh, conversation. It can't be in pockets. And when we do uh, try to legislate in pockets of, well, let's do something, something, on healthcare, let's do something on education, and we missed the big picture of making Georgia uh, 
B. Uh, we often tout from the from the well we present bills and oh I'm from the great state of Georgia I'm from the great state of whatever and but are we doing great things to make it great um, and that means everybody benefiting instead of you know Medicaid uh, uh, giving certificates or vouchers you know we can't pick and choose how we want to uh, manage or or legislate in order for some to benefit and others not. And I, and I do want to move on, but I do want to add that it's it's estimated, and um, Chairwoman Cooper, you correct me if I'm wrong, it's estimated 500,000 Georgians would be eligible under Medicaid expansion. That's an additional 500,000. Uh, and I know other states that were once did not want to expand, but they have Georgia, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not always right. I believe Georgia is among just 12 remaining states that have not expanded Medicaid. Are y'all looking at what options those other states and, all, and initiatives they've put in to expand. And have y'all looked at that? I'm just curious. No, I think they have. And you're right. It used to be about 400,000 Georgians, but with what's happened from COVID, it's gone up and you are right on that, Rose, uh, for doing that. And I mean, like I say, the talks are ongoing and, you know, and in response to the Senator, you know, I think she's fairly new to the legislature. It's just like sometimes you do what you can within the parameters. It's like, I got a six months expansion uh, for mothers postpartum. Would I have liked a yes? And got $20 million in a tight budget to go with it. Would I have preferred a year? You bet your life I would have, but I wasn't gonna get it. So instead of giving up, I went for the six month expansion. And sometimes I've learned on issues, you know, you go after what you can get and you come back again. To, you know, to work with the Repres argument. Representative Cooper, I, I, um, I'm not sure if you remember, I am not new. I actually served in the House before I got to the Senate. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, so. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. Yeah, no problem. Um, and even with the postpartum uh, funding, um, that was a bill by Representative Mabel Thomas, and it was, it was uh, sent to the committee and and, 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 and those things were, um, were brought to light. Um, and I appreciate your efforts to push for that. Um, but uh, I, I think, as I said, when we legislate in pockets, we miss the big picture. So we have to do better and be more intentional about um, making sure that, that we can have a, a healthy balance in, in all communities. Thank you. I want to move on to workforce development because I was chiming in. Actually, I was being nosy and looking in at some of the budget hearings. And I, I, I happened to um, stick around for Commissioner Black, Agriculture Commissioner Black, who talked about challenges he had in retaining personnel who were leaving to go to other state agencies because they just couldn't match the salary. And I know that Danny put up a slide that there was some attempt to with pay increases. But when you look at the governor's proposed budget, what else could be added so that you all are making sure you're retaining and state employees that they're not just not only just leaving the state, but going to another state to the same agency because it's more money? Uh, who wants to tackle that? I, I'll jump in on that if you don't mind. Sure. One thing that we are working on and I'm very excited about and there's money in the budget to do this is uh, for the first time in uh, I think about since 08 or a long time ago, anyway, over a decade ago, uh, we're going to be able to give the, the, the retired state employees uh, that are participating in the Employment Retirement System, ERS, uh, a COLA, uh, cost of living increase, which is great, but uh, bigger, larger than that, it's not going to be just a one-time shot. We are, we've got, and, and Chairman Huffstetler and Chairman Tillery have worked tirelessly on this uh, with the House, their counterparts in the House, but there's a, a plan to uh, increase the match to the 401k for uh, current state employees. I think the match is currently um, 3% and it's gonna be a scaled uh, match that will ultimately, if they stay longer, they will get a 9% match. Um, so it's a, it's a fiscally responsible plan that we think is sustainable and we can afford, but that will, will encourage 
uh, retention uh, of employees that have the tenure and experience that is so valuable, uh, they will their 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 benefit package will be greatly enhanced through this uh, project, and there'll be a um, ability to have colas uh, on a regular basis. That's enough. That's enough. Good start, Senator Walker. I think that's going to help with retention. I think raising the pay scale to five thousand uh, dollars will help with uh, attracting uh, employees, and I hope the really the huge enhancement to the retirement package will help greatly with the retention. I would love to see, you know, if I, if this would be a massive undertaking, but I think what Commissioner, one thing Commissioner Black was saying, and I tend to agree with it, um, an across the board pay raise is not exactly how I would want to do it. I, I think it could be more targeted and more, uh, because uh, he, if you remember, he talked about wage compression between the different uh, levels of the job and that kind of thing. So I think, you know, possibly giving agency heads a little bit more flexibility to uh, target where the raises need to go might might be a different approach, might or might not be better. But I am excited about the um, enhancements to the retirement plan. All right. Well, and if there's any department that we know, all the, the departments are important. But when we talk about the agriculture department, he was talking about meat inspectors and and things of that nature. Those are folks that we definitely need. Anybody else want to comment on how do we retain state employees? One thing I would add real quickly is I think uh, and, and, and I'm going to go a little bit philosophical, if I may, Rose. Um, okay. But one, you know, I, I know being in the legislature uh, going into my sixth year now. Um, you know, there's always this debate between big government versus small government. Um, and certainly, um, you know, the folks in charge very much believe in small government. But I think the approach, there, there should be a paradigm shift here in which the size of government should not be as important as whether or not government is effective, right? We need effective government because um, we're talking about food safety inspection, right? Especially when it comes to public sector workers, we're talking about teachers. We're talking about uh, police officers. And, and so certainly, you know, I think first and foremost, we need uh, an understanding uh, that we have to respect uh, pu the public sector uh, workforce, not just in terms of um, ensuring that they are paid adequately and have the benefits um, appropriately, but I think in terms of um, our rhetoric and, and how we are viewing public sector workers. Um, so especially in this, pandemic in which we understand that a collective response is needed to this collective challenge. Um, hopefully, um, again, uh, with the governor's proposal to increase, um, you know, uh, uh, the public sector employees uh, uh, pay by $5,000, hopefully that's a good start. And hopefully we can continue to move in that direction um, and respecting, not just with our actions, but in our words, um, the, the vital job that public sector workers do in the state of Georgia. Thank you. Uh, we had lost Senator Anderson, but now she's back. Do you want to chime in on retaining state employees? Yes. Um, well, I'm sorry. I missed the question. I'm not sure. So we, so we were talking about retaining state employees, and Senator Walker talked about some of the incentives that the governor is including, including, including the cost of living uh, expense and then also uh, retirement packages. Uh, I just want to get your viewpoint on that and how is there enough in the budget proposal to make sure we can retain these, our state employees? So I, I, it is very important that we retain our um, state employees and offering them uh, benefits and incentives um, that will keep them is, is key. Um, we've run into a problem already of state employees and, and, and previous retirement um, promises. And so I just hope that this time um, that they are fulfilled and that we can um, have a very um, steady, sustainable uh, workforce uh, for the state. As we're building, we continue to have to uh, make sure that we're taking care of the people who help build. Thank you. We want to encourage everybody to go ahead. And if you want to include a question in the Q&A, um, we have a couple of questions already. I'm going to go ahead and sprinkle these in. 
uh, for the, here's a question as an anonymous attendee, and that's okay. For those who do not support Medicaid expansion, but do support the partial expansion, can you explain your reasoning given it covers fewer people at higher cost? Who wants to take, tackle that? Well, I'll tell you what the word was from the people designing the program was. Is, and Medicaid, regular Medicaid does not always have the best of outcomes. Across the state of Georgia, we have 229 federally uh, funded community uh, health programs. They are our safety net. People can go there and if they have no money, pay zero, or if they have money, pay $5 or $10, what, you know, on a sliding scale. Uh, the outcomes that they have, and they have physicians, often they have, have a dentist and a psychologist. I mean, I can't say enough about the federally funded health programs. They are our safety net, and people don't know about them enough. But the outcomes they have are better than the outcomes by our Medicaid program, which is one of the most costly, the one that has the uh, highest rate of increases all the time. And so when Georgia was doing their program, they were trying to begin to do a Georgia program that would answer to some of these and then look toward expand, you know, as they got the program underway to then use what they had learned and see if they could have better outcomes on it. And this was why they went for that type of program. But let me tell you, I hope everybody you know, these federally qualified health programs, one of the reasons that they can get physicians quicker than we can to go out into these rural areas is because the federal government has a loan program which pays back their, you know, two or three hundred thousand dollars worth of medical school debt much more quickly and uh, than we can do on a state level. Uh, so, and we are very short of physicians all over the state. Uh, except in the metro areas. And one of the things that I'm really excited about in the governor's budget, there is money for 136 new residency slots. You know, we've upped the medical schools, trying, you know, Morehouse is emphasizing rural. Mercer is emphasizing doctors and training them to want to go to rural areas. But the trouble is, is they leave the medical schools and if they can't get a residency slot in Georgia, then they go somewhere else. And often if they leave the state, they end up practicing in the state where they went for their residency. So the governor in the budget, yes, has put in a money for 130 new, uh, 136 new re residencies and they're for primary medicine, which would have an emphasis on working with mentally ill also and for psychiatric uh, residency. So, uh, that was your answer and a, and a big plug for getting more residency slots in this state. Residencies cost a lot of money uh, because of the faculty that has to be there and all the uh, requirements for them to be nationally accredited. And so it's not just something that a hospital can go out and start on their own. And uh, this is to help with our, our need for keeping our doctors in the state and kudos to Mercer kudos to Morehouse for really seeing the need for uh, an emphasis on rural medicine and primary care medicine. You know, just uh, general practitioners, uh, OBGYNs, uh, psychiatry, the kind of things, pediatrics, the things we need in our rural areas. So I can't say enough about those two schools of medicine and praise them and thank them for taking that route to uh, work with um, uh, students. And, and I want to say to Morehouse, Morehouse will also take students that the score on their test to be, get into medical school would probably keep them out of other schools of medicine. They are lower. But after the first two years in Morehouse, those kids are knocking the top off the two year, the first exam they take. So kudos to Morehouse, kudos to those students. Uh, it just goes to show that your score on your MCAT is not always what's going to determine how well you do in medicine, and I can't thank them enough. Sorry, I'm on my bandwagon. Senator Walker, you want to add anything? Uh, yes, I do, and I, I'm going to get a little philosophical or policy, uh, just a policy difference in, uh, in my view of things. 
Um, and this is a great conversation, this Medicaid expansion conversation. Uh, the, the rural hospital administrators that I talk to, and I do represent several, tell me they cannot survive off of Medicaid. They can't. Um, they, it's better than Z, it's better than getting nothing for the services, but it's, they tell me it's like 10 cents on the dollar and they cannot survive on Medicaid. Right. So first of all, if you add 500,000 people on Medicaid, who's gonna serve these people? Thank um, you. We don't have the physicians to do it. A lot of doctors don't even take Medicaid because it's not, they lose money. So who's gonna serve them? The hospitals, it's gonna put a, uh, a lot more people maybe at the hospital, but there, it's not a profitable patient. So you've got to have that patient mix with Medicare and private insurance to go along with the Medicaid for these hospitals to survive. So saying that expanding Medicaid is gonna save our rural hospitals is, I don't think that's accurate. Not. Um, but now I'm not, let me, I'm, I'm not in the camp of saying no way in hell do we want to add anything to Medicaid. I mean, our Medicaid budget goes up tremendously every year just because of our population increase. But I don't think you're doing people, the citizens of Georgia, a service if you don't show them and ha have a pathway for them to move off of Medicaid and off of welfare programs and off of this great society deal. I just don't think you're doing them a, a favor. Our unemployment rate is 2.6%. There are jobs out there. We've got to give them a hand up and quit trying to give a hand out for everything uh, that, that people think they need. That's my philosophy. So I thought the Georgia way was a very uh, clever and, and well thought out way to let's, let's help the people that need it. Let's help these uh, single moms uh, that are raising children, but let's don't make them dependent on the government forever. Let's give them a pathway out of that dependency. I wanna give <laughs> Representative Park or Danny or Senator Anderson a chance to respond. Uh, thank you, Rose. So uh, first and foremost, I would say, you know, thank you again to uh, Chairwoman Sharon Cooper uh, for taking the lead in passing an extension of Medicaid for mothers to help address maternal mortality. And I think that demonstrates the importance of the Medicaid program. Uh, certainly when it comes to outcomes, uh, Medicaid compared to private insurance may not be as great, but as Senator Larry also, Senator Walker also mentioned, um, some health insurance is better than none whatsoever. And there are more than 500,000 Georgians going on eight years now who could have otherwise had some minimum level of health insurance had the state of Georgia expanded Medicaid. Now, when it comes to the waiver programs, you know, we're looking at the 1115 and the 1332 waivers. Other states have applied for an alternative, non-traditional Medicaid expansion like the state of Arkansas, in which they covered the vast majority of their uninsured program to great benefit. Uh, the Georgia program has three components, if I may go through them real quickly. Um, I think there's full bipartisan support for the reinsurance program, uh, which the current budget also fully funds that has helped lower uh, premiums uh, for, for all Georgians who have any sort of private health insurance programs, and 14 states have that kind of reinsurance program. Now, the two other components of this Georgia program, I do not agree with. Um, as Chairwoman Cooper mentioned, the 1115 Medicaid waiver, which had work requirements, uh, was rejected after initially being approved by the Trump administration, but it was rejected by the Biden administration specifically because of those work requirements. In fact, Georgia was not targeted. This was not a political move. This was policy. Um, you know, all the other states whose work requirements were approved only during the Trump administration received a letter from CMS saying that they would have to rescind those work requirements. And when those work requirements are uh, challenged in court, they are struck down because they fall outside or do not pass muster as being violative of the original purpose of Medicaid. Um, 
And so the last component, and, and so again, I think, I, and I'm open certainly to an alternative way in which we can cover our uninsured population. Arkansas, for example, used federal Medicaid expansion dollars to pay for uh, the premiums of private health insurance for the uninsured uh, population, which I don't see as a handout, but as an opportunity to obtain preventative health care, which in the long run will help lower health care costs across the board. Now, the last component, uh, which I think is still being debated, which I think all of us should be mindful of, because I think it's open for public comment right now, is Governor Kemp's proposal to eliminate healthcare.gov and to essentially send, and, and healthcare.gov right now has allowed more than 500,000 Georgians um, to receive private health insurance. By removing healthcare.gov or preventing Georgians from utilizing that program, it would essentially take us to before the Affordable Care Act, before um, you know, we had a marketplace in which we could compare different health insurance plans. And so that 1332 waiver um, that I believe was approved by the Biden administration, but is currently being, uh, that was approved by the Trump administration, but is currently being reviewed by the Biden administration, um, again, I think would increase um, if approved or if that moves forward, uh, the elimination of healthcare.gov would increase the number of uninsured Georgians, um, which would certainly exacerbate the fact that we have the third highest uninsured rate in the nation. The other uh, important part I would mention about healthcare.gov is that every single private insurance plan that is permitted to be on the exchange meets certain guidelines, certain basic minimum standards, which again, if you remove that healthcare.gov marketplace exchange, you know, then it becomes a free-for-all, right? Then private insurance are able, to, are, are able to sell cheap plans that may not provide the coverage that folks may need if and when they get sick. And so, um, you know, it, it is very concerning to my, to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Um, you know, I think when it comes to healthcare in the state of Georgia, um, we don't have to go it alone. Um, we can look at the success in other states um, and learn uh, to ensure that we are moving forward with the best policy on behalf of Georgians. And I hope we can do just that, um, especially now that um, you know, the current 1115 waiver has been put on pause. Well, Sam, Bruce. the only thing I would add to it, maybe Larry's gonna, the governor wasn't, when in doing that, they replaced uh, where you went to get into the portal, that they replaced it with another means of looking at health insurance rather than what the government, the government provided. I mean, they didn't just eliminate it. And there was no way for people to go and shop for insurance. Right. That's, I just want right. to go ahead, Larry. Jump in. <laughs> but hold on, hold on. Before, Senator Walker, before you continue, let's bring in Danny, then we'll come back to you, then we'll go to Senator Anderson. Make sure everybody yeah. gets a chance to chime in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to make a few observations. And I think that, uh, you know, we, we've heard some really positive things from, from everybody here that, that could, could lead to a, a really strong path forward. I mean, I think one thing just to be clear about is that even what we've heard discussed here from, from everybody, what we've heard mentioned, and the proposals in the budget could make this, this year, this budget proposal, the biggest step forward that the state has, has taken to ensure more people uh, in the last decade. So, you know, I, I do think that it's worth noting that both on postpartum Medicaid, on the, the fast track enrollment for children in, in SNAP and TANF, on, on reinsurance, and then on, I think, this acknowledgement that for the people under 100% of poverty who have no path right now to get insurance, if, if you don't get it from your employer, you can't qualify for a subsidy on the exchange right now, we'll see that that's been a subject of, of a lot of federal debate. Uh, and, and could have been part of the Build Back Better plan. Um, and, and then, you know, if you can't get it for Medicaid. So, so that is the group that, that Chairwoman Cooper mentioned that I think, you know, I mean, there, there's widespread acknowledgement has to be addressed. And, and that's going to be an ongoing, I, I think, debate as, as we talk about Medicaid expansion, as we talk about ARP funding, as we see if there are changes made in this federal debate. Um, but so, you know, and, and I think that uh, the, these folks are going to be part of that. And then I also just want to um, kind of conclude by saying 
that the budget that we've been talking about is the starting point. Um, and, and so the two members of the House here, you know, are, are going to be uh, in, engaging in more debate, and, and that's going to be crafted. And I think that there are a, a lot of moving parts to this. One of those that touches Medicaid significantly is the fact that the federal government has, it, under the public health emergency that, that was extended this week for another 90 days, is covering a larger share of Medicaid significantly to the tune of several hundred million dollars than it normally does. And, and that could be ex extended uh, longer, you know, I mean, unfortunately, uh, Omicron, other things, the pandemic, obviously, you know, has not subsided completely. And so that could create an avenue uh, of hundreds of millions of dollars that, that could evolve in the budget that could be available as it moves through um, for all of these folks. So, so we're just getting started in a lot of ways, but I think it is positive. Um, you know, th th there, there's clearly some agreement and, and of bigger issues. And, and so, so I think that uh, that is one takeaway that, that we yeah. have from today. Okay, and before we, I wanna give Senator Anderson and then Senator Walker wanted to have a final comment. So Senator Anderson. Thank you so much. I have been um, jotting down my notes so that I can keep focus. Um, so Representative Park, um, thank you for uh, those comments because I, um, We agree that ex fully expanding Medicaid um, costs, not ex fully, not fully expanding Medicaid, I'm sorry, not fully expanding Medicaid costs um, more to the state because it exhausts our emergency rooms, our, uh, our clinics, uh, our immediate care facilities. Um, and, and, and I, there's so many comments made and I'm, I'm trying to keep my focus, but creating, um, Or, or, or I shouldn't say creating. Well, yeah, we're creating barriers instead of removing barriers. We're creating barriers um, to, to keep um, access to a quality affordable health care at a low. I mean, it's not giving a hand out. And I, and I heard, oh, it's $5.50 or so whatever the people pay to, to have access, but it's not a hand out. It, it's, it's the system. It's absolutely the system. Maternal mortality is systemic. Infant mortality is systemic. Access to or lack of access to healthcare is is systemic. Um, the comment about you know the, the the kids at Morehouse knocking it out of the park. Education is systemic. All of these things are have been barriers for years. And unless we, those of us who um, serve communities who are underserved, um, understand that. Um, it is not um, easy to, 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 to have access, then it, it, it seems as if, oh, you know, they're, they're champions and they're, they're great and mighty, but they were great and mighty before the MCAT. They were great and mighty before, um, you know, that's why HBCU was created because there were no other opportunities. So I'm, I'm, a blind eye is turned to uh, most of the issues and the problems and the less those of us who served the underserved bring it to your attention. No one was talking about maternal mortality until it was brought to the attention of the General Assembly saying these people live in our state, we live in this state and access to affordable healthcare should be afforded. So we, have to uh, we can't continue to turn a blind eye and, and, and make it seem as if, oh, the opportunities um, are equal because they are not. We have to have real conversations about how the system is set up. And, it, and that is what it is. I, 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 I don't apologize for even presenting it in this way, but my whole point is we have to be more intentional about how we have um, legislated or overlooked what needs to be um, in place when it comes to when it comes to our state, Georgia is changing. Georgia has changed and it will continue to change. And those things that we um, have not uh, implemented will be implemented one way or the other because Georgia is changing. I'm Thank done, you. I can't. Senator Walker, I wanna give you the last word on this and we'll move on. Well, first of all, to echo what Danny said, this is a, I'm delighted to be having this conversation. Right. 
Um, I think uh, that there are a lot smarter people about this than me, no doubt about it. And uh, we can come up with some, a solution if we keep working on it. Uh, I do appreciate Representative Park talking about, you know, looking at other states that have uh, crafted a, a waiver program that's been successful. I think we need to continue to do that. I certainly don't think the Republicans uh, uh, have a monopoly on good ideas and good policy. And I'm I'm happy to continue this conversation. I think that, um, you know, I do think CMS is political. I'll, I'll disagree with uh, Representative Park on that. I think the fact that we gave um, our now in comp, we gave a 5% increase on the now in comp waivers for uh, community service of developmentally disabled uh, people. Uh, last year, it was supposed to go into effect July 1st, 2021. Uh, CMS has failed to allow that uh, provider increase. Uh, and with the wage uh, inflation that we're seeing, these providers that are taking care of our developmentally disabled are going to be going out of business. And I don't know where these people are going to go. Uh, there was a federal lawsuit and, and we had to close down our, our state hospitals and, and serve these folks in the community, which is probably the right thing to do. But now they won't even allow us to, um, we budgeted for and, and approved an increase in 21. They, ha they haven't allowed us to pass that increase on to providers. And I think that's political. And I, I, I think that, you know, they, want, we, they haven't even renewed our now in comp waiver program. So uh, I just, you know, if, if my friends on the other side of the aisle can help us with that, uh, that that's a critical need that I hope we can work together to get resolved. I think our nursing homes, especially in rural Georgia, are in a crisis that you're going to see nursing homes closing. Their, their census count because of COVID is down 30 percent um, and they just can't survive. Now, this latest tranche of money that Danny uh, mentioned, the extension of the uh, enhanced Medicaid payments, Maybe that'll be a lifeline for those nursing homes for 90 more days, but, but what, what are we gonna do after that? So I think there's a lot of stuff we can work together on and we really do need the Democrats to help us uh, with this, uh, especially you know with the Biden administration, um, because I think politics does play into it. Um, and, and you know, Sarah- I appreciate Walker, that, Senator Walker. I appreciate that, I'm willing to help. You know, Senator Walker, that's a great way to end this conversation, um, talking about bipartisanship and, and what it means for elected officials like yourselves as you represent. Yeah, you represent your districts, but you also represent the entire collective body of Georgians. Um, so let's start with that. And, I, and I'll, Senator Walker, I'll start with you. Uh, just how optimistic are you then that there will be a, a an effective uh, bipartisanship spirit this legislative session to get some of these priorities done, not just the budget, but some of these other priorities that really affect all of us. I call, a, I call them the tentacles tied to our quality of life, and that's health, health and wellness, education, workforce development, mobility and transit, all of those, education. So I'll let you start with that in terms of the, a bipartisanship spirit here. Uh, I'll just be honest and, and quite frank. I, I don't, I think this is going to be a tough year for bipartisanship. Uh, I just think the, uh, the, the elections uh, that are coming up is, is going to make it somewhat difficult, but I've always uh, tried to be respectful and, and open-minded and listen to my uh, colleagues and friends. And I have dear friends in, you know, in the democratic party. Um, so I, I hope Georgia does not turn into what I think Washington DC has turned into because I just, uh, that's not the Georgia I wanna, wanna see for my children and grandchildren. Uh, we're stronger if we can work together and, uh, but I, you know, politics is what it is and there's some, it's gonna be a tough, tough year, I'm afraid. But the conversations like this help. help a lot. So that's, I'm glad, glad to be here. Chairwoman Cooper, you're next, bipartisanship. Okay. Well, hopefully the house will be a little different, but I have a different perspective on it because I don't look at healthcare and I chair the health committee, except for when we get into the Affordable Care Act. But the other bills that we move are about 
helping patients. And, and that's not Democrat or Republican. And I find that on my committee, you know, I get a lot of bipartisan support on, on the issues that affect patients and in doing what we can do. Um, and everybody's talking, this is gonna be the year of mental health and uh, trying to get more uh, services to our mentally ill. And I think you will see a lot of bipartisanship on that. Uh, there's been a lot of money put in the budget for different programs. And as they come forward, I'm moving out a bill on Tuesday. Uh, it's an advanced directive for those that are mentally ill that when they're not in crisis, they can put forth a directive on how they would like to be treated uh, when they are in crisis and they can select somebody to represent them. Uh, they've been working on that for about 10 years or more. And now the everybody's come together on it, the lawyers and all. And so hopefully we'll get that passed. And, you know, there's a big bill coming. I mean, you know, we are short of beds because of the feds cutting back. But one of the ways, very simply, by taking a state rule off, we don't have a rule that Medicaid mentally ill, Medicaid patients on mentally ill can't go to private hospitals and us pay med Medicare rates. So we're gonna to try to change that because a lot of times private hospitals, especially in rural areas, the private mental places, they'll have a bed or two that we need. So there's a lot of things that we can do to work on this mental health issue. Uh, it has the workforce problem. Georgia, Georgia just has, and I think it comes from, if you go to Boston or all, there, every time you walk down the street, you see a medical school. And for so long, uh, Georgia had two medical schools for a state that's the eighth largest state in the world, in the country. And uh, so we have a work short shortage in all of the areas. And that is going to be a big issue. And I think everybody, anything we can do to improve our workforce, uh, I think that it'll be very bipartisan. So maybe I'm an optimist, but I've worked with people on my committee and on the other side, I've worked with Sam on issues, I, on an individual basis, I think there's a lot of bipartisanship in the house. So I look forward to being optimistic about it and going forth and you know what? I don't look back, I look forward. And so uh, I'll just say, I'm looking forward to working on any kind of issues that we can work on uh, that will improve the healthcare of Georgians. And that's my goal, thank you. Chairwoman Cooper, Senator Anderson, bipartisanship here. Thank you, uh, Rose, for that question. I um, actually do work in that bipartisanship space. Um, I, I gained relationships in the House while I was there, um, and those relationships carried over to the Senate. And I've gained new relationships in the Senate. And so um, working in, in the uh, criminal justice reform space, I have always um, had bipartisan um, support on legislation. And so I look forward to that continued um, work. And um, I, I think it will be, it may be fast and furious, Senator Walker, but I think we can still get fit in some bipartisan support for one another. Okay. Representative Park, you get the last word up. Uh, thank you, Rose. Uh, so I, I, I would agree with both uh, Chairwoman Cooper and Senator Walker. Um, I think there is an opportunity for bipartisanship. It's been an honor to work with Chairman Cooper to move a lot of important initiatives uh, forward. Um, but I think this is going to be a challenging year. Um, hopefully, over the next few weeks, uh, we'll be able to find the common ground and, and move some of these initiatives forward in a bipartisan manner. Uh, certainly, when it, when it comes to local redistricting, uh, which as chair of the Gwinnett State House delegation, I'm uh, very much uh, consumed with that. That's my primary obligation. But of course, as a member of the minority party, uh, you know, Republicans control the governor's mansion, the state Senate and the state house. Um, and so I hope uh, that, you know, that that spirit of bipartisanship will keep the door open and that we can do good for the for the citizens of Georgia. Thank you. And Danny, do you want to add anything before I close it out? Absolutely. Just briefly, you know, I, I want to say that at GBPI, we are a nonpartisan organization. I can tell you that I have worked with all of these folks here uh, on, on, on different issues uh, and, and that at the end of the day, uh, you know, that, that they are public servants. We appreciate them being here. I think that we've had 
good discussion, good conversations that can be the start uh, of, of a lot of progress. Uh, and, and certainly, uh, you know, that there, there are, are probably things that, that folks have heard that they may disagree with uh, from individual members, but, you know, on, on, on any given issue. Uh, but I think that there, at, at the end of the day, uh, everyone here wants to move our state forward uh, and, and, and that, you know, that they're, they're going to continue to work together to do that. All right. And just a side note, because I'm, I'm all as a journalist and I love to research, the average MCAT score range is from 472 to 528. Mercer's at 505 and Morehouse High School of Medicine is at 504. So do what you want with a piece of information. I think it's important. So thank you, everyone, for your time today. Now there's going to be a quick 15 minute break. We ask you to join us again at 11 a.m. for a discussion on race, equity and budget. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. Good conversation. Thank you. Y'all have a great day.